stars in a ring. Man, I go hard like Santan. What is going on, everyone? Back again with another episode of Touchline Hotspur. And well, what a week it's been, for, especially for us Spurs fans. I mean, we've been in the thick of it throughout the entirety of this week. I mean, how you guys been? Oh, Dave, what, what are you saying, man? Boy, I feel like uh, it's like frontline journalism trying to follow uh, Spurs at the moment. It's like a, a story every two hours. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a weird one. Um, actually, it's kind of been a distraction from what we've seen on the pitch, actually. Um, but no, I'm good. You know, I think everything's going to settle down now. And uh, we've got the cup final. We'll just see how we kind of clap. Um, yeah, all good. Um, tops, man. What? What are you thinking, man? What's your? Yeah, I'm good, bro, man. I'm good, that? man. Like, <clears throat> just you know, I feel like this bondage has been released, bro. Um, <laughs> he's gone, but um, there's there's still there's still work to do. But you know, everyone's got uh, like a spring in their step. Everyone's looking a bit happier. Everyone's looking a bit shinier. So can't complain, man. Can't complain, bro. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, man. I hear you. We're, we all look like we've got a much bigger smile on our face, and it's <laughs> genuine and sincere. It's not. It's not this fake smiling where, where we're upset and you just have to put on a brave face. We actually look. I think we're all genuinely very happy now, relatively at least. But yeah, yeah. We'll just start crack on, man. We'll start off with the sort of the Jose sacking. Um, we already done an emergency bod. Um, so, um, if you guys. If, viewers if whoever's listening watching can go back to that see the direct reaction from the lads but i mean he's gone he's finally gone we'll just quickly sort of sum it up because it's quite a lot but i mean how do you guys feel how do you guys like what is the what are the emotions going right now in, in regards to jose Mourinho? start off with you tops um like so obviously like my my position has always been i've never been his biggest fan um, I feel like we had some sort of flash in the pan sort of form where what he was doing seemed to be working but like lots of people have said it wasn't sustainable and to be honest with you there's lots of different reasons why I believe he should have gone way earlier than this um, but honestly I feel like in the bigger scheme of things this is probably the minimum that we needed to have had happen before the end of the season I feel like there's lots of different things that has obviously happened with the European Super League, us going to a cup final, different changes in the team. But I feel like we always knew that we were in a position to, to get rid of the manager. And I think Daniel Levy didn't really need much of, a, of an impetus to, to do so. I feel like this has been a long time coming. And obviously we're hearing things from the football club about how people were treated um, how specific people were communicating with the coach and obviously how people weren't even happy about the way we were being coached. So, you know, I'm more than happy, man. Like, I know there's a lot of stuff to change at Tottenham, but I feel like his time had to come to an end and I'm, and I'm just happy it has to be honest with you. I'm happy it has. Definitely, and I think most can agree with that. Dave, do you think, do you think it was too late? Do you think we should have got rid of him a lot earlier, a lot sooner? Um... That is, that's a good point. I, I, I didn't think we would. I thought uh, the, the board would probably hold out till the end of the season, um, regardless of the finish. I think they all. it was quite obvious that there was a friction in the team. Um, so I, I, I thought maybe in the summer we'd see a change. They decided to make the decision now, just before our League Cup final. You know, uh, whether that's wise or not, you know, obviously people could debate that, but it, it has lifted the club. Um, you can see it in some of the players' reactions. Um, you can see it in some of their silence. You know, some of the players are silent on, on his sacking. Um, is it too late? I think after Zagreb, the writing was on the wall. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, that's when, you know, I've, 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 I knew this day would come, <clears throat> whether it was the first season or second season. You know, everyone knows how Mourinho gets on. But I thought maybe we'd have a chance of winning something or, you know, at least getting back in the top four before it all fell apart. But for me, that week was horrible, man. That that North London derby yeah. and the decisions he made with number two and keeping number two on the pitch for 90 minutes. And it was so naive. And 
I, I think it just that was for me was where you know I started to you know see the coffin being brought out. Um, so I think he's on borrowed time from there, really, and nothing really has picked up. Obviously, we've got the Aston Villa win, but then you know we draw in Newcastle, getting pumped by Man United, drawing with Everton. It's it's just one one disaster to the next, really. So. You know what looked like a decent enough run in has now become really like you know really high pressured. You know we've got to win every game and to get any chance, even top six. You know the battle is on. Um, I think even more frustrating, other clubs around us were dropping points. Yeah. You know, so we could have really pushed on. Absolutely. Win against Everton, win against Aston, uh, Newcastle. Sorry, get Man United. You know, like, it top six game. And you know, man for man, they probably are a better team for us in in, in their form, and you know they can break us down because they've got the the qualities that can get past you know our kind of low block and that kind of thing. But those drop points, man, and that stat that we hadn't you know we hadn't um, you know we lost the most points from going ahead in the league. You know that was embarrassing, um, and there didn't seem a plan. There didn't seem to be a plan or a way out. So. He's gone. Uh, I didn't believe it at first. I, I was triple checking every reliable source on on Twitter, um, and then Fabrizio t- um, tweeted it, and I was like, "Okay, cool." Um, but no, like, you know, it's it's we need to push on now, and you know, got seven games left or whatever. Plus, obviously, the final. Let's just see what we can do. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, yeah, it. The writing was on the wall for a very long time. I I said um, back in. I think after the Liverpool game, sack him just before the League Cup, so we get a new manager bounce. But the team, the team is still so bad. I, I don't think we would, we would uh, get much out of that game. But we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, so yeah, that that's Mourinho. Jose's gone, and I feel we should all of us, not just Tottenham fans, but Jose sexuals as well, just move on. Just move on from this guy. He's done. He's finished. He should either take the Portugal job where he doesn't have enough time to spend with the players to have a moan at them or he should just go upstairs and take on a role, a more senior role somewhere else. But either way, Jose Mourinho is done and apparently he um, went back to the training ground for an hour to tell everyone um, a few home truths. Um, Classic Jose, isn't it? It it is, it is. I mean, what's he going to say? What's he going to say, really, that some of the players maybe don't already know that he hasn't, up to this point in the league or in the season, already said? I find it quite, I don't know, I I think it's very disingenuous to be like, he's now going to be honest with people when he's had the whole season, to be honest. There's lots of opportunities that we've looked at. Games against Newcastle, performances against West Ham, performances against Arsenal, performances in Europe, that he's had the opportunities to tell people these home truths, to kick guys in, into sort of gear. And it's only when he's been kicked out the door that he feels that he now needs to be honest and open. I'm not hearing that, man. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I mean, 17 years in the game, he's got his dues. He's won his trophies. He's got his accolades. You know, this was just one job too far for him. And it's crazy because whether we like to believe it or not, this will stick with him for the rest of his life because this is the one job where he, you know, he hasn't won anything. So he's going to really... St- in, in his mind, he's going to look at this job and almost look at it look at it as if he has failed because he hasn't had the opportunity to win anything. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it does seem like a ploy from Levy as well to just ensure that he doesn't win that final so that he doesn't, when the season's over or when Mourinho gets to speak out or when he writes his book, he can call Daniel Levy out. That's what I feel like, the timing of it as well, to be honest, mm-hmm. but... Again, he was never going to win that. He was never going to win that final. Let's be real. It, pff, he was going to park that bus, soak up pressure, and allow Sanchez, Dyer, whoever it is, to make those mistakes. But yeah, again, we'll talk about that later. Um, another big thing that happened soon after the Super League and its collapse. I mean, pff, how quickly was that <laughs> downfall? <laughs> it was. Um, it, it was a very spursy. Situation. It was it was very Spursy. I mean, Florentino <laughs> Perez would be a great fit for for us. If he <laughs> was there to lead our club, but um, yeah, this is absolutely insane. And I think 
Man City were the front runners in that and Chelsea as well. To be fair, they didn't need it, to be honest. It for the owners of those clubs it was more of a sort of vanity project, those clubs and um the rest of the um, owners of the other clubs pretty much needed that money. Real Madrid especially it was it was it, it was to facilitate their debts. It was to obviously clear it, help help them out. And they're obviously using us to do that. We obviously needed it as well, obviously for funds, the stadium, you know, so much, you know, capital that could be generated generally because we know how our owners operate. But, I mean, did either of you want, were either of you tempted to, for the Super League to happen for our benefit? Did you guys think it would have benefited us a lot in terms of on the pitch success? Yeah, I, I think you know I, I can see why, as a, from a business perspective, you go for it. Um, especially with the rumor changes to the Champions League format, expanding that. You know, if you can guarantee yourselves a, a paycheck every year when you've got to pay off a stadium, then then why not? Um, from a business perspective, obviously they failed to take the temperature, read the room, um, and you know. Fans have, have pushed back, but let's be honest: all the other companies that have pushed back is because they're not in on it. You know, you, we've seen it already. UEFA and FIFA are more than ready to make a, a, a quick buck over and under the table. Um, the Premier League are very quick to do that. Sky, BT. Um, so it's not it's not as clean cut as I think people are trying to make it out like a victory for football. Um, it might even be delaying the inevitable. I think we'll see a few more power moves from from even maybe from UEFA to kind of safeguard their product. Um, but at the end of the day, money money is ruling the market now. You know, you've got twenty year olds getting towered around for a hundred, hundred and ten million pounds. You know, money is what what drives the market. We we have to be real. Um, we see it in ticket prices. We see it in vanity projects like you know some of these stadiums that are going up and some of the decisions that owners make over the past few years. Um, so, yeah, I, I understood it from a business perspective, but again, you know, it was, you know, kind of, it went against the spirit of the game. Um, but then you can say many things over the past 10, 20, 30 years have gone against the spirit of the game. You know, there is already an unequal um, competition in, in the Premier League. You know, you look at transfers. Yeah, we went, you know, the we, we story we went in for Ruben Diaz, so did Man City. Game over. <laughs> you know, um, we'll find out on Sunday. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, it, it, we all know, and I think we're we're okay with the inequalities that are all there. But this was was probably a step too far for many fans um, in terms of really pushing a wedge between the haves and the have-nots. Um, but yeah, it's done now. Like I said, the Spurs collapse. Um, you know, typical. We get involved. You know, we, we start to flash our little big, big club card, and then it all falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that, tops. Do you did we ever? Did you ever think we had any right to be in that? And say, in about ten years' time, if this approach was to come again, mm-hmm. would we, with the same number of clubs, would we be in that? Well, see, I think this is a good question. You see, because like. One thing that like kind of irked me over the last few days was the amount of strays that we were catching from all different all different people, because I feel like it's kind of a it's a, I think it's a balanced argument in the sense that I I fully believe as a football club as a business as a brand we have willed ourselves into this conversation. I do believe what Daniel Levy has done as a as a as an owner in terms of building the success of the. Academy and obviously getting a complete football stadium and not just a football stadium but a multi purpose sort of um, arena which we can bring in multiple streams of revenue. Yes, the value of Tottenham as a football club has gone up, and obviously the potential revenue will go up, and obviously the value of the football club will go up. So, absolutely, if we're talking on a money perspective, absolutely we should be involved. I think we're the 10th richest in the world in terms of footballing clubs. So, yes, that's on that side, I feel like we should. I also don't really buy the f- the reasoning that because we've not performed adequately in Europe 
over a sustained amount of period or we've won any European trophies um, that we should then be sort of discounted from the competition. I feel like Pochettino did an incredible job of raising the profile of the football club on the football inside. Um, we were in the Champions League four or five years consecutively and in which one of those years we got to the final. Um, I do believe as well that lots of people talking about different things with regards to what your club has won and people talking about football heritage. I mean, people were mentioning Arsenal, but Arsenal haven't done anything on the European stage for a long time. And their last uh, domestic league title was more than 10 or 15 years ago. So the question that Tottenham shouldn't be included in that conversation can be definitely put across to a number of different other, other people that were in that conversation. I personally feel like we deserve to be there. Um, I feel like we are one of the top six uh, clubs in in the league. And I do believe that in the future, something like this should include us, hopefully, because our brand would hopefully be bigger. And I'm, I'm hopefully, I'm praying hopefully that we would be a more successful footballing side, hopefully on the European stage as well. So absolutely, I, I, I don't like, I don't buy this mentality that Tottenham is also, it's all the winners and Tottenham. No, I, 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 I don't hear that. Football changes as well. See, you know, for for a long amount of time we weren't involved in this conversation, and all of a sudden Leicester won a title. But because Leicester won a title, they have literally no European pedigree. They're not being included in this conversation. There's a reason that we're being included in this conversation, and I don't think it's very fair to say because we haven't won in Europe or we haven't won any trophies or domestic titles in X, Y, Z amount of time that we should be discounted. You know, I think we're rightfully there alongside some of the others. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement. And I just feel that a lot of football fans just put their own spin and their own reasons as to why it's happened. Florentino Perez in 2009 said he wants to gather the wealthiest clubs, the richest clubs. So you can only look at it through a financial lens. That's the point of the Super League. It's a financial thing. You know, you can people always say, you know, why are Arsenal and Spurs there? Well, because they got no European Cups and then wait a minute, Atletico don't have European Cups either. They have European they have the Europa League and UEFA Cup like us, but and much more recently and they've obviously won league titles, but you know, then they yeah. move the goalposts and change the reasons because you know football fans they're not they haven't got the highest IQ, let's be let's be real. But um <laughs> But anyway, um that Super League it led to a lot of protests um, in the week for all the clubs involved, in, in England at least. And we were one of them. Um, the Chelsea one was big. It was, you know, it, Petr Cech came out of the bus, told them, listen, we're going to sort this out, essentially. And, um, yeah, he eventually, Chelsea, Man City, they pulled out um, pretty early on. And then the rest of the clubs followed suit. Then we had our protest yesterday, um, which, I mean, first of all, what are you protesting about? Because I, for me, I don't know, that it's, it, it feels very disjointed. Some fans are protesting Enoch out generally, some fans are protesting the Super League. What, what's the general, cons is there a general consensus between the fans? Because I didn't feel I got that. And then you have the people that um, went were protesting saying Enoch out but yet yeah, went to the the shop itself and bought a few bought a few t-shirts bought a few trays <laughs> all, the, <laughs> all the all the all the merch that you could possibly think of <clears throat> i mean dave like what 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 was it what was the purpose of that protest exactly because i, I you know can't what? answer it i think the protest was more embarrassing than us signing up to the esl um Watching that footage of what fifty, maybe <laughs> that, um, just you know, sauntering around, couple shouts here and there. There was some, someone might have had a drum. It was so like lukewarm. It was as confusing to me as some of our performances of late. And literally, I literally felt like I was watching Jose Mourinho's uh, tactics in protest form. Some were going this way, some were going that way, some were, some were hanging back, some were going forward. It was it was the weirdest thing ever. And yeah, I don't know, it's, it's like you said, people were protesting different things. 
Um, and some people were buying merch and protesting against the owners, but giving them money. Um, and I think it just goes to show, I think, to be honest, uh, to a certain extent, some of the, the confusing takes we see on um, on Twitter, you know, and social media. I've not had the privilege of ever being um, an admin on the old uh, Touchline Hotspur account, but I know some of you have, have responded to a few of the wild takes that we see out there. Um, and I think if, I don't know if this has always been the case, um, but I do think the past 18 months has really kind of just divided a lot of the fan base. Um, I think we don't know which way to look. <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is that there's a, there's issues at the club at all levels. You know, um, if you're going to protest, you know, the, the board and maybe protest the manager and then protest Eric Dyer starting at centre-back, you know, there's always something you can protest because at all different levels there's things going wrong and bad decisions being made. So it was very confusing, very divided. And like I said, um, I did feel like it was just, it was all over the place. And it was quite embarrassing actually, because, you know, Chelsea, they're all united. They stopped the bus, <laughs> you know, um, they delay the whole game or whatever. Um, even today, Man United, I don't know, it was a smaller group or whatever, but Man United fans, they, they gate crashed um, the training ground and you know, Oli had to come out and speak to them and all this kind of stuff. Tottenham, we just sauntered around with our Spurs, Spurs store bags. <laughs> when, we speak, when, when you were saying that it reminds you, it's just as embarrassing as the team. <laughs> that boy band was definitely Harry Winks in number two. Oh my life. 100%. Oh, 100%. Who booked that guy? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't one direction, it was misdirection. <laughs> Just like Harry Winks' passes. But yeah. Um, anyway, um, enough slander. Um, tops, I mean, like who, first of all, who, who would you protest against if you were to? And how would you protest as well? Because for me, you protest with your pockets. You don't just go to the match and shout Enoch out, Enoch out, and then go pay them, pay Enoch themselves, give them what they want, buy I'm, tickets and buy shirts. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very much of, of that mindset. Um, as I've got older, as a, as a Tottenham fan, I've, I've seen the bigger picture for the football club. And I feel like whilst Levy has made lots of, Bad decisions or questionable decisions, I also feel like he's made a lot of good ones. And I feel like, as a football club, he has probably our, our interests best in hand. But in terms of the part owners in which we're talking about, Enik and Joe Lewis, I feel like there's reason for us to protest against them because they are almost seen as a, a group or you know a set of people who don't all have who have any real play in the football club or the running of the football club, but more the financials and the business side of things. Um, so the only way you can really ever affect that sort of side is literally by not spending money, not going to games, not supporting the club in the way it should be supported. Because whilst it's detrimental, because it's, it's the football club that you support, that you take joy in going to see every week and watching on the telly, they need to know that you know we're humans too. We listen to everything that they say and we like are mindful of everything that they're that they're doing, you know? Um so I'd be more inclined to say Enic out, but I mean for now, Daniel Levy is quite happy to still be very sort of integral in whatever the Tottenham project is as a business, as a football club. Um so for now I I, I can't really fault him in terms of what he's done. Yeah and um, well, can I, sorry can I just add to that uh, if you notice when you hear rumours of takeovers, um, you hear a rumour of a takeover and Dan Levy is usually keeping his position. Yeah, yeah. Like, people respect him in the business world. They know, he, you know, and he's managed to keep hold of, you know, some of our assets, you know, and, and yes, we've made mistakes in some of our purchases or whatnot. I think you can maybe look at the manager. I think maybe he should step back. Levy should step back from the scouting and... and recruitment side of things. He should just really be writing the check. Um, but like I said, he has a new business and we have now got one of the best stadiums in the world. Um, and and it's, it's one of the situations where even with, without us winning anything for 13 years or whatever, we've still managed to be in that top 10, <clears throat> you know. So 
Now we need to get it right. We can't go another three to five years like we did on the Pochettino. As much as the Pochettino days were great, we can't risk another five years because other clubs, the Leicesters, the um, well, we know obviously Liverpool have had their their, their good run. They'll be back up. Um, there'll be other teams in and around us and then around that top six who will start to put pressure on us on the field. Um, and it doesn't matter how good a staging you've got um, if you don't win games. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I agree. And um, like, I was always Levy out, Enoch out, like, and I'm definitely Enoch out for sure. Um, I I got a bit more of an education on Levy and what he's done, and in terms of the football infrastructure itself, and where we were. And you've got to put yourself in your shoes when when you were younger, and when we were <laughs> when we were celebrating draws against Arsenal whilst they were celebrating winning the league title, and you got to put into perspective that those first 10 years under their stewardship that not winning any trophies or winning one trophy you can sort of let that pass by because you know we're not the kind of club that should be winning trophies at that time the only gripe I have now is the past five years where we should be going for it when we you know we have we finished on the record 86 points and yet we own we sell our best right back and um, we replace him with Aurier and we buy Davinson Sanchez, who's been pants. Um, and then, you you know, 2018 window, you don't spend a single penny. And it's just things like that in the past five years that tell me that they, they, they're they good for taking you to a level. But it's once you're at that level, I don't Can think they know. Yeah, yeah I don't that's... think they have the funds and I don't think they really know what to do because the recruitment as well has been poor. Let's be real. The recruitment of late... <laughs> And the cohesion and the choice of man, like not just the recruitment of the players, but the recruitment of the managers as well. Like, you know, it's not been a good fit, and the footballing side needs to needs to arrive. And there are rumours of a director of football um, coming in place. Who knows if that happens? We've had what Camoli, Baldini. You know, we've had these people. We'll see. We'll see. I I don't trust. I, you know, Levy's done an amazing job. I don't trust him with footballing decisions. That's the problem. But anyway, um, those after those embarrassing protests, um, we had a football match, uh, and that was against Southampton. And I mean, that first half was poor, um, and the second half was a lot better and much less of a Jose Mourinho type performance. Tops, talk us through it. Um, yeah. So obviously, Ryan Mason's first game. Like we understand he had probably like two days to sort of get ready for uh, the, uh, the team. And then all the things coming out of the football club, media-wise, you know, he it almost seemed like a goodish fit because he had played under our last most successful manager, which was Pochettino. So one thing that he kept saying, which I remember he kept saying about being positive and being completely, like playing with freedom. So I was hoping that we were seeing a performance um from players who, you know, not so much a new manager bounce, but can almost play with sort of a freedom and a relaxed sort of nature that allows them to express their abilities. Because one thing that we can never, ever deny is that there is a lot of talented players in the in the football club, in the squad anyway, first team squad. And there's a lot of players who almost, I feel, have maybe been shackled under Sacramento and Mourinho. So, you know, we started with uh, Regulon, and Aurier at fullback, and we went with Toby and Dyer, which is pretty dire. Um, in midfield, it almost looked like we were going with three with Le Celso, um, and Dombele and Hoybier, and then um, Kane was missing for injury, so we had a almost a fluid front three of Bale, uh, Lucas sort of through to the middle, and then Son on the left. Um, first half was a bit frustrating to watch. I felt like Whilst we were building up play it, at times, um, it was quite easy to play through us. Southampton were picking up lots of dangerous positions um, and it almost looked like at times that we were being overrun in that midfield. They were just flying through with ease. Um, Lucas missed a very a very good chance. Son missed a very good chance. Um, and then obviously we unfortunately took, we conceded a lead through a Danny Ings corner, um, which, I mean, in terms of the defending Aurea probably could have pressured him a bit more, but it was very, it was very tight and it was like very well placed in the corner. So going in at half time, 
I was very interested to see how um, Ryan Mason, Chris Powell and the coaching staff were going to try and allow us to play. Um, and you know what? In the second half, it improved. Um, I was starting to see a lot more attacking patterns that maybe I hadn't seen previously. Um, we did look like we were playing with some sort of impetus and lots of players, especially in the attacking third, seemed to be playing very closely to each other and playing quickly, which is something that we maybe missed. Um, Bale got us the equaliser, which was from the end of a very good move. Um, that obviously came out to him and he was able to put that away. And then we were able... We had a, they actually had a goal disallowed, which was a very, very well well put together goal, which we progressed it very well through the midfield. Um, Le Celso, Lucas, which Sun finished, but then just because it was offside, unfortunately that that wasn't um, that was that was chalked off. And then the one thing as well that, that that I was happy about was that in the final fifteen minutes, it looked like we were going to score. It looked like we were actually playing with sort of not an identity yeah. but we were playing with some sort of impetus like we wanted yeah. to try and get out of the game and you know a number of different attacks were able to be uh, formed in which we kind of we were fortunate in getting a penalty Sun put that away and largely as well we were able to hold on you know like imagine this season we are one of the worst teams in terms of our winning from losing positions and holding on to uh, leads as well so to see out the game is just as important to score in that second goal as well for me so all in all, you know, um, for Mason's, for Ryan's first game, I'm, I'm buzzing for him, man, because like he was part of the Pochettino era. Um, it's good to see the boys kind of playing a bit more positively. Um, I wouldn't say we played amazingly, but you know, this is a this is a work in progress. Two days, two days of training with them, getting to know everyone, getting everyone kind of sort of dusting off the cobwebs of Mourinho and Sacramento football, you know. So we just got to look forward and try to think about the cup final now, really. But yeah, man, buzzing. Three points, man. That's all that, that's all that matters. Seeing, seeing out of these games against, in my opinion, opposition that is largely inferior. We, these are games that we should be winning. A number of times this season, the Newcastles, the, the Evertons, the, the West Ham's, Arsenal's, we should be getting these wins at home. And for some reason, we haven't been, you know. So I'm, I'm happy that we were, we were able to get that, that result. Yeah. Dave, um... This is the first game we've come back from behind since December. Now, and Gareth Bell said um, in an interview that the halftime team talk by Ryan Mason was a lot different. It was, you know, much more positive and obviously, you know, tried to get us playing on the front <coughs> foot and looking look at the ball for you know look at look forward a lot more. What do you think changed? What what was different about that second half to the first? Yeah. Um... I think it's actually December 2019 was the last time we came from behind in the league or something like that. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> it's yeah, our, our stats. <laughs> it's not great. Um, and yeah, I think what, what changed and like Top said, I was I was so frustrated after that first half. You know, I was like, new manager bounce, mate. This is not even a hop or a skip. <laughs> it's just like what on earth. Um, there was no cohesion. They looked like a bunch of strangers. Um, but thinking back and having a bit of time to reflect, I did only have, what, two training sessions? Um, you know, obviously on Wednesday, um, they don't train. So he only had Monday where everything's going crazy. You know, what do you do in that first training session? You know, you don't even talk to the guys. And then Tuesday was just one opportunity. So there wasn't cohesion. <clears throat> And I'm glad that he did get that halftime opportunity. You know, I think if we had gone in at nil-nil and then conceded early in the second half, I don't think we'd pull it back. But I think having that natural break in the game gave us an opportunity to really reset. Maybe it gave him, <clears throat> as a coach, a chance to say, look, remember, this is what we're trying to build. Um, and we took more risks. The first thing I noticed, we played higher up the pitch. We played high, our, our centre backs were just in the in you know in, in the centre circle as it were, um, and you know Toby likes to do those 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 diagonal passes. You know, um, it gives him that space to do that, and there's always an out. Um, and even though players were still not playing that great, you know, Lascelles didn't have a good game, and Dombele took sixty minutes to wake up, um, and even then he was he only had a good few moments. Um, to be honest, I thought Son wasn't great until the last 15 minutes. 
Um, so there were poor performances from even some of our better players. But you can master when you're positive, when you're attacking. You know, they were trying to go on one, you know, <clears throat> there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of the moves that they were doing, one touch, two touches. You know, it, and what I liked, and, and, you know, both the goals came from periods of sustained pressure. You know, what you didn't see in the first half and what we haven't seen in recent weeks is we attack, it doesn't work out, and then we're defending for the next 10 minutes. But what we saw yesterday in the second half was we attack, it doesn't work out right, we go left, might go right. You know, we choose different yeah. angles of attack. So I think that was encouraging to see. Um, but at the same time, it did make me think, what on earth are we going to do against Man City? You know, because tradition says we kind of sit back a bit and hit them on the counter. That's when we've had our best games, even under Poch. You know, we haven't always been as free-flowing. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, what Ryan Mason does. Um, but happy we got the three points. Um I'm not really looking for much from Ryan Mason. I'm more looking at the players. I'm saying you're old, you're big enough now, you're seasoned enough to to see out some of these games. Sheffield United got Leeds. You know, we should be seeing out some of these games. So let's see what happens. Um, three points. We're, we're what two points off four. Um, I don't think we'll get top four, but we do need to get top six. You know, if we're realistic in terms of some of our targets financially and attracting players. Um, and yeah, I mean, if we don't get top six, we might see another one of them protest. <laughs> God forbid, God forbid. <laughs> um, I mean, listen, like, who would have thought, right, playing on the front foot, you know, like you said, you know, switching angles, switching directions of play would tire the opponent out, would, you know, increase yeah, the chances yeah, of point. scoring a goal, you know. And we did this with that Harry Kane as well. Apparently, apparently, according to these Jose fanboys and you know these people that love the man, without Harry Kane, it's impossible to win a game, even against Newcastle, even against Southampton. If you don't have Kane, that's it. You're you're finished. You're done. But shock horror, we win. You know, <laughs> we win. that that more drives <clears> home <throat> the fact that he has the inability to coach because so many different teams that we have definite more quality. He can't find a way to beat some of these teams, and. I'm happy because yesterday he would have watched that match, I promise you, and he would have seen, all right, this is a game that maybe we wouldn't have even thought about trying to win. But in the second half, I was seeing diff I was seeing stuff from Lucas, I was seeing stuff from Sun, I was seeing stuff from Hoiberg, I was seeing stuff from Regulon. You know, which in the last few weeks we've seen none of. We've seen none of, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I think I don't know if you guys remember, <clears throat> it's about maybe four or five years ago under Poch. We had a game, one of my favourite games to watch under the pot. It was away at Swansea, I think. Yeah. And we yeah. were 3 1 down. Yeah. And we won 3 2. And we scored two goals in the last like eight minutes or something. Yeah. Right. Including, um, it might have been like 90th minute and 93rd minute, something like yeah, that. Yeah. It was two and right? time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember because at, at no point did I think we were going to lose that game. Because we were just going after it. You know, in my head, I'm like, okay, at least an equaliser. Then when we got an equaliser, I'm like, you know what? If there's enough time, we yes. might spin something. And I, I kind of had that same feeling yesterday. Once we got that equaliser, I thought, this is it. But, you know, a good couple of clear chances and, you know, keeping Son on the pitch. Yes, he didn't have a great game, but keeping him on the pitch, he's our best finisher. Um, yeah, he's obviously, you know, I mean, he had the one ruled out, which was a great finish. Um, but they touched away that penalty and yeah kudos to Ryan yeah and I mean yeah it was it was a good positive change he made and for once you know the players looked like they wanted to play speaking of Ryan um, there's a lot of sort of oh. argument about the sort of Chris Powell and Ryan Mason situation itself and who why Ryan was chosen as a, as the sort of first team head coach manager whatever you want to call it and why Chris Powell who's got significantly more experience um wasn't basically um what do you guys think about that situation what do you guys think um the reasonings could be and you also got ledley king as well who was jose's uh well in the backroom staff again defensive coach and why he may not have been promoted but what's your thoughts on that um so we spoke about this a little bit haven't we like like 
I think on the face of it, I don't want to read too much into it because I feel like Ryan Mason, he's been in the club for a long time as a player and obviously as a coach in the last uh, year or so. Um, I feel like his role was always going to be something that was maybe, uh, given the opportunity, would probably move move higher in the club. Uh, you know, I did, I did wonder why maybe Chris Powell wasn't given it initially, purely because of his experience level. So Chris Powell has managed um, Huddersfield, Southend, Charlton, lots of other clubs. I think his most recent one was he was assistant in Holland or something. Assistant, assistant coach or assistant manager to someone in Holland, and then obviously he's he came back to Spurs this last year um, and taken on a coaching role. So there's clearly a depth of experience with Chris Powell. Um, one thing that we could always suggest or maybe even consider is that maybe he wasn't even offered it, or maybe he was offered it and decided not to take it. Um, we don't know whether he maybe was happy to just take a sort of back role. Um, in terms of the coaching staff around the club. Uh, one thing that we also maybe could suggest is that Tottenham have seen it as sort of a an interim role, similar to what we had with Tim Sherwood, whereby we knew that it was going to be for a short period of time and we just want someone to almost steady the ship, someone who knows the football club, who's well-versed in working with Levy, who knows like how things are done. Um, and also as well, potentially just that link to Ryan Mason to our best sort of, you know, period in the football club in terms of the way we played. Um, he was a member of the Pochettino sort of era um, and maybe he could try and influence or sort of um, bring in some of the ideas in terms of how we used to play with sort of decent attacking fluidity and patterns that Pochettino played with. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to look at it as a racially motivated decision because I feel like, Nelly King was all, was also there, but I wouldn't want Nelly to have taken that because, you know, as we've seen, I, I, it really irks me having legends ruin their legacy at football clubs. And I feel like Nelly, as a first team coach, who I don't think has even finished his badges, is someone that you wouldn't you really wouldn't want to want him to just take the reins just because. Um, and I feel like as well, in the scheme of things, Ryan has nothing to lose. He's twenty nine years old. He's probably still doing his badges, and I'd say if he was to do a good job he'd be doing a good job. He's, it's, it's interim. I wouldn't want to see him take on the job full-time. I feel like he probably still has a lot to learn about the game. Like He's two years um, junior to people like Gareth Bale, three years to like Toby. Uh, so he is, he is on the young side. But for now, steadying in the ship and you know being sort of a familiar face that a lot of the lads do know from when he was playing, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a funny one. Uh, Chris Powell, he, I don't know. It's very difficult to say. It's very difficult to say. I'm, I'm very, I'm very mixed on it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't definitely want to want to look at it as a, a racially motivated thing. No. Dave, do you think um, because he was he did play with a lot of the lads? Do you think it purely was vibes? Whereas Chris Powell will be doing all the sort of the smart tactical work in the in the sort of the oh, background yeah. in the coaching. Oh, without a shadow of that. Um, so Chris Powell was, um, I think, head of our academy or one of our academy coaches. Yeah. So was Ryan. So they've already worked together. And I think it's a situation with, you know, I mean, if you look at Chris Powell's stats, he only won about 35% of his games as a manager. percent times of the games. You know, we need something a little bit better than that. Um, but even, I think it's, it's similar to what happens in the NBA quite a bit. You know, they appoint a young vibrant manager and then you look at his bench and they're all seasoned vets they've all been there before you know and i'm sure when they go into their tactical uh, meetings and whatnot it's it's definitely a case of you know multiple people chiming in <clears throat> building their identity um and i think ryan is the safest bet you know we all have a connection to him he has a connection to the club and um, he's an academy boy um, he's been at the club what, since he was nine. It's like twenty years that he's been involved with with Spurs in some way. Um, and obviously, we know about the injury. The, you know the reason why he had to retire. You know, everyone had a lot of time and empathy for him and his story. 
And I think for Levy, he's looking at it going, this is win-win. <clears throat> I've disappointed, you know, the man that most people consider to be second to the devil um, when it comes to world football. Uh, and now I've got the, 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 the nice academy boy who can just, who says all the right things. He's not going to piss off the, the players. Um, he knows a lot of the players, like I said. It did concern me how young he is, if I'm honest. I did. I thought he was older, just because you know you've known his name for so long. Um, but I mean, he's younger than me, and he's two years younger. And I was like, whoa, like 29, and you're taking charge of, of Tottenham Hotspur. That's pretty, pretty wild. Um, but he's off to a good start, and I think you know he could actually. You know, I'm not talking about the League Cup final. I don't think we're going to win that, but I do think he can maybe get two or three wins under his belt like to change a bit of the momentum in terms of the way we play. And even if we don't qualify for where we need to qualify, it's look it's going to look good in his resume. He'll probably save a bit of respectability in our season um, somehow, some way. Um, <clears throat> and we go from there. Um, racially motivated, racially charged? I don't think so. Um, I think, to be honest, I think Spurs have made enough statements about their views on black coaches over the years. Um, obviously, we know about Hugo, who um, sadly passed away. Um, the anniversary was yesterday, wasn't it? Um, Chris Powell's involved. Ledley's involved. There's a few others involved as well, lower down um, in the academy. And I think moving forward, maybe we should. it should be something we are aware of and see where the progression goes. Um, we don't want them just to be hired in the background. And there may be some um, more high-profile opportunities to come. Um, but it's interesting to see that Spurs are making inroads in terms of hiring black coaches and developing them yeah and i again i won't rule out the racially motivated aspect of it because it you know it could be possible but um i'd like to think it's not um but yeah um yeah the thing with the ryan mason story it, it was heartbreaking when you know when i first saw that game as well just seeing the pain as well i was just you know I don't normally feel that level of emotion like with footballers generally. I, you know, I like football, but I'm not that attached to footballers. But when I saw that, I was like, "Wow, damn that!" I really felt for the guy. Um, and uh, since ever since then, I've just taken, I've just warmed to Ryan Mason a lot more since that situation. I know he was one of our own anyway, but that particular incident, I was like, "Yeah, it's, no one should lose their career like that." And um, I do want all the best for him. Um, so I'm guessing we can all agree that regardless of how well it goes, we don't, we would still wouldn't want him as as manager. Oh no, no. I mean, yeah. you know, he, he, I'm sure he hasn't even completed any of his badges. And as as you said, there, <laughs> it's a win-win because think about it, right? He's young, he's getting Premier League management experience, and he'll just go back into the fold at Tottenham afterwards. He can do no wrong here, and Levy can do no wrong here because Levy knows that he's got an affinity to the club. And the players will like him and, and they'll know him. So, he, he, you know, we can't really go wrong here, you know? Like, so, like imagine the scenes if he was to win this this this, this, this final on the weekend. Imagine. I'd you love know? it. I'd love it. But before we get to the weekend, just a quick question. Who do you guys, well, who do you guys want? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't know, man, because... Realistically. Dave, what do you think? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think? Ah. Uh... May I go back and forth on this with so many different people. Um, I, what I, I think, you know, the important thing is the profile um, in terms yeah. of their style of play. Okay. We have to, you know, when we talk about Tottenham tradition, where we play you know, from 60s, 70s, all that kind of stuff, exciting football. And I get that. And yes, I do want to see exciting football at the lane. At the same time, I, I want that to be married to win. You know, so whoever we do get in, if it's the guy from Ajax, I can't remember his name, is it Ten Hag? I don't know how to pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of him. And I think it's almost like the more natural progression because his projects kind of come to an end. Um, he's sold some of his better players over the past few years. And um, one of his players who I've wanted was Randa Beck and he might be able to swing a little couple phone calls and get man in if we need to, you know. Um, but, you know, we'll see. But I think Ten Hag is probably the most likely in terms of most natural fit coming out of where he's at. Everyone's talking about Nagelsmann. Um, I think it's a bit too far-fetched because I think Bayern Munich is calling. Um, 
if they haven't already. You know what they're like. They sort these things out so early. Um, and there is a rumour that Levy got rid of you know this early to kind of steal a march on Bayern Munich. Um, but I think Nagelsmann might stay in Germany a bit longer. Um, some of the other names being floated around. Sorry, no, I'm not sure about that. Um, Rogers. Rogers is a weird one. And I had, I had a chat with some, some football guys at, at work today. One of them said that Leicester was a bigger club than Spurs um, just because they've won the title. Anyway. Um, Goodness sake. No, no. They're a better it, club. Right. They're performing better, but bigger? No. No. Um, but we were actually, you know, would you leave Leicester to go to Spurs? And I think Rogers is in a position now where he knows he doesn't have the spotlight on him. And okay. even Spurs in seventh or sixth or whatever, you have a spotlight on you. And I'm not yeah. sure he wants that in the same way he had it at Liverpool. That's my and thing. And it's not worth going sideways or backwards to Spurs to yeah. do that as well. And like Leicester, we sh- we're not a stepping stone club for the next level of club. We're... we're st- <laughs> Leicester are that stepping stone club to get to that bigger club. We're not, you know, we're not in the position that's lucrative for him. Yeah. In terms of trophies and the position we are in the league, tops. What do you think about this? Is another one, sort of almost left field, but not really. Uh, Nuno. Ah. Uh, he was actually the first one I thought of. No, I no, no, no. Out. <laughs> They've had injuries. Ooh. It's 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 an interesting one because I do like the way that Wolves play, but I almost feel there's when I watch them, I feel like sometimes they're pulling the wool over your eyes because there's certain days you watch them and they look brilliant, and there's certain days you watch them and they just look, frankly, very average. Um, I understand that he's very keen on the three at the back. Uh, with the wing backs, obviously number two, um, prolif- proliferated or made made a career for himself playing in the, in that right wing back, which we've now been to see, you know, that he was clearly just being coached very well in that position, as opposed to him being a decent ish footballer. Um, I do like the way that they, I, I do like Wolves' player acquisition, but then I also feel that there might be something underneath the table going on with the Portuguese players and the type of players that they get in there. Jordan so I'd be Anderson. interested to see how he would perform in a, in a scenario outside of that. He wasn't my he wasn't my first sort of idea, but I could see I could see there being a potential um, link because again, Wolves would be seen as a club not similar to Leicester, but as a club that you would be used as almost like a stepping stone into a bigger club in the Premier League. Um, you know, the more and more I think about it. Uh, I can only really look at two that I would be happy with at this point, which would be Ten Hag and Nagelsmann. Um, like Dave said, I feel, I feel like Nagelsmann, even though, again, he's young, but yeah, I've watched and read a lot about him as a manager, his profile, um, his style of play, and I feel like that's the kind of manager that we would be suitable in looking at as a manager. But I also feel like moving forward, with the buy-in job now becoming available, it, it would probably make sense for him. Like, it, I mean, for him, it would be an amazing tra- trajectory considering where he's come from to be able to get that job at buy-in. But again, the way they monopolise the football over there with the one or two teams being, you know, sort of the leaders, it would be kind of silly for him to reject it, you know? Um, but I also do understand that potentially Levy may have, you know, pulled the trigger early, try to get a march on that. That wouldn't. I wouldn't be upset at that. Try to throw the bag at that, and just throw him the entire project that we offer. But in terms of footballing, you know, I'd love to see Ten Hag at Spurs. I, I really would. I feel like the kind of philosophy that they have at Ajax with the kind of players that they've been able to develop, and I think he also managed Davinson Sanchez as well um, when he was Ajax before he was able to get the uh, the move to Spurs. So. Like I feel there's lots of positives about him. I feel like the cycle maybe has been done for him at Ajax. Um, they've sold a lot of their good players uh, or players that have gotten to a decent level and he still hasn't, you know, like 
his name hasn't been smudged. He, he's still got a very good reputation. So um, with the kind of players we have, especially the amount of youth players that we have coming through and coming back, you know, I'd be very happy to have him as a, as a manager at Tottenham. Um, largely for the footballing league, largely for footballing league. I, I want to see Tottenham play with a structure, with a style, with a, a pattern. And I feel like um, the way that they play football at Ajax, the way that he's coached that side, I feel like that would be a good fit for Tottenham, especially with the kind of plays we have, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think with Ten Hag, I think you need, with the director of football talks or, or rumours that are happening, we need the right one that, that could the right profile essentially that would provide the right players that would you know help recruit the profile of players that Ten Hag requires because you're not just gonna I don't think we should expect that style of football instantly because that's not gonna happen with these players or there will quite a fair few of these players but Davidson Sanchez you know um, could get the best out of him Nuno could get the best out of number two so you know <laughs> yeah. there's all kinds of possibilities all kinds of possibilities um but yeah, we'll we'll move on to the big one, uh, the final um, Sunday. Yeah, isn't it? <sighs> I mean, here we go. Uh, here we here go. go. As Fabrizio Romano would say. The thing uh, is, though, is that like it's it is like what's the word I want to say? We are like primed because I feel like it's win-win. In all, it's kind of win-win in the situation because we've got nothing to lose. We've got nothing to lose <laughs> against against a very good Manchester City team, who most teams would be happy to lose against. But I feel <laughs> like <laughs> we need this monkey off our back. We absolutely need this monkey off our back, and I will carry this Tarling Cup trophy shamelessly across my Twitter profile. For the next season or two. <laughs> however, however, I also believe that in the scheme of things, this should be like the start. We should be routinely getting into finals. We should be putting ourselves in these conversations, in these positions, because as a football club, that's the kind of team that we want to be. You know, the teams that are routinely playing in these cup finals, routinely playing in these in these uh, in these positions to win trophies. You know, yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Dave, uh, talk us through what your lineup predictions, man. What, how do you think we'll approach the game? Ooh. How do you think? Who do you think will start the midfield position, which was a bit sticky? There's room, you know. There's discussions about whether Wink should play or not. Yeah. Um, um, there's so many pros and cons either way. Like, there's not one lineup where you think, "Great, we got a a bet, the best chance." Because whichever way you go, that you can. Like and the team I see, they can it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, they will find a way. And yes, they don't have De Bruyne. Yes, they don't have John Stones. Uh, he's suspended, obviously. Mm -hmm. That might give us an in. I think Laporte and Diaz for them two are obviously the thing they're as in in terms of pace as well, which is what we would probably have to play with to beat them. Um, in terms of lineup for us, obviously Hugo and goal. Um, oh yeah, right back. No, sorry, Tanganga at right back. I'm, I'll go with Jaffet. I think yeah. he's all been he's been topping big games, and I think as a Spurs academy player and academy product, I think he just has some excitement where he knows don't don't piss around. Come on, like this means so much more to him than it would do to Serge Aurier. I mean, I don't think Aurier he takes. Serious enough at times, a bit like um, do you remember Asa Cotta <laughs> for the vibes? <clears throat> so um, yeah, I love Tanganga, Toby, Regri on at left back, and next to Toby, I think Rodon. I think he's our safest bet. I don't and think I th he's he's eligible. Oh, is he not? Is he not? I don't think oh, he's... Oh. I'm pretty sure he wasn't registered for the League Cup. You could be right, you know. You could be right. Well, I think you're right, you know. Yeah, I think you're right, you know. Yeah. yeah the reason like, why I'd say him... The reason why i say him, I think... I think he's a good prospect. And I think he plays even better with Toby next to him. 
Yeah. And he suffered in recent games because he's had the donkey Davidson next to him. Or, you know, Mr. Yeah. Mr. It wasn't me. You know, yeah. Eric Dana. Um, so, I think, you know, with Toby, he'd, he'd have done well. It, it's, it's, I don't know, pick one. It's a choice, it's a choice between the donkey and polygon head. Oh. Unfortunately. Yeah. Like, pick pick one. one. Honestly, less than two. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Sanchez against them in the last game was absolutely horrible. Horrible. Like, horrible. And I don't think he's got over that. I think I it would be better. Your, I like your Tanganga uh, pick as well because that game, he locked up Foden and Sterling. Both of them didn't have any... They, they yeah. didn't give him anything that day. Anything. I, there, there hasn't been a big game that he's played in that I don't think he's come out badly. I think he's sorry. I think he's come out well in all the big games. The Liverpool game, which was his, his first game for us last year, he did very well with Mane on the left, playing as a left back. Um, and I think he did well, like you said, against Foden and Sterling. They had to keep switching and trying to find new angles and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so I think yeah, he's got it. But he suffers when he's next to Sanchez because Sanchez pulls him in. Yeah, because he seems to. He seems to. He seems to perform better in bigger games when the spotlight is on him, when the pressure is on. I feel he's more concentrated um, in those games because because of that pressure. I think yeah. that's a good mentality to have to because you've got players like Aurier who, who will slack off, who will yeah, yeah, yeah. lose concentration no matter the, the occasion. Yeah, um, and I feel like I feel like you know Man City's play down the wing, down the flanks. They're all about creating those one on ones. And then cutbacks, and I think Tanganga's a better one-on-one defender than Oye is. Just, just facts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apart from that, I think you know if Kane is is fit, then I think I go with Kane, Lucas, Son, Bell as our front four. Um, I think Lucas deserves to start. He's been one of our best players over the past few months, yeah. and even even last night, always tracking back, always trying to win the ball back. Um, he got a couple of fouls and, and I think he yellow, got a yellow card yesterday for that, but he was the one putting in effort in the first half. And in the middle, I'm not too sure. I mean, I, Tops, with, with Lo yeah. Celso, yeah. With, there's, there's been a lot of criticism about he his performances. Be. Yeah. Who do you think should be with... It's going to be Ahobia. Who do you think oh, should I, be partnered alongside him? And because yeah. Dombele has been poor as well. you got to remember that. and. Poor. He has been poor. I, I can't even, you know, normally I'm, a, I'm an Ndombele stan, but I just feel the last few, I would say maybe a couple, I want to say last month and a bit maybe. More, I've a bit watching more him. Let's say two months. Yeah, watching him and it's just been, like, on the ball, you know what he's going to do. You know what his, his ability is. But when you're watching his, his sort of influence on the game, it's just, it, it's almost very laboured, um, kind of frustrating to watch and, He's not doing the things that we know that he's very good at. Not not affecting the game in in many ways. So, I feel like I do agree with Dave's front four. I feel like Bale has to start because at the end of the day, you don't get to cup finals and not play players who have won in cup finals. So Bale is a guaranteed starter. If Kane is fit, he has to play. Son has his place. And yeah, I believe that sort of in that ten sort of eight role, you're going to have to have Lucas. Lucas is almost a bit of a live wire, you know. He's the kind of player who's happy to take the ball on, he's happy to try and beat players and open it up in the attacking third. So, I'd be more than happy to have him there. Then that means you are going to play sort of a two in that double pivot area. And Dombele will play. Um, and Hoiberg has to play. I feel like the Chelsea hasn't done enough for me since he's returned from injury. Uh, I don't think he's thing, done the enough, thing, period. The thing about him... We know that there's a player there. We absolutely know there's a player there. Because you know, people say, okay, what has he done and what has he shown? But there was a period in the re- after the restart where he was single-handedly carrying in that midfield. And it was all action, all, all robust, sort of, even in the attacking third, creating and bringing people in. But I feel like maybe, I don't know, there's something stopping him at the moment because he's come back from injury and... He's not, the, he's not the same. He's not, he's not, he's not playing with the same vim. And I, and I don't really know what it is. So, uh, personally, I wouldn't start him on the weekend. I would go with the front four that, as mentioned. I'd go with Ndombele and um, Hoibier. Ndombele, 
against Man City also tends to sort of raise his game as well. Yeah. Uh, so I would hope that this would be a big enough game, um, especially with the with, without Kevin De Bruyne in that sort of ten area. I feel like the, on the weekend the game is going to be dictated by like City's wingers. I feel like if people like Foden, Mares, and other Silva have have good games. It could be a long, long night for us. But as long as we can try and keep these kind of players in check, I think we've got every chance, absolutely every chance of winning this game in the weekend. With, with, with no De Bruyne, there's absolutely every chance. And if Kane is playing, there's always a chance. Always a chance. You have to be optimistic. I think it's a cup final. Nah. But, but the funny thing is, <laughs> we've got quite a weird record against Man City. We do, don't like, we? We do. When we really Pep took over... Remember when Pep took over and they went on this mad run of you know unbeaten games, unbeaten, yeah. you know, unbeaten run or whatever, and then we ended it with us think four one, we beat them. Yeah. Um, obviously no, that was two nil, the two nil. Yeah, you know we we beat them on on occasion, and it's not necessarily looked hard. Um, and I, I don't know what it is, and I think what maybe plays into our favour, they do have a massive game midweek. Yeah, and um, that Pep might prioritise that um, because there's just added pressure to win that Champions League and yeah. he might rotate the squad and pff, that might be to our favour but it might be to our detriment because he won't overthink Sunday and his issues come from overthinking and that might be an issue for the, the game against Paris so pff, I'm not optimistic I do not I, I I think sacking Jose has increased our chances of winning this game from two percent to ten percent. Wait, sorry, sorry, uh, lads. sorry, lads. The game's this Sunday, no? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the so the okay, sorry. City aren't playing Champions League this week. They've already played, haven't they? Yeah, they no, played last night. Yeah, they played last night. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. But they've got Champions League on the Wednesday, I think. Oh, the Wednesday. So mm. they're thinking of that game. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that game, yes. I mean, I can see. The, the one thing, as you said, Jack, this notion of him over sort of thinking his lineups, I feel like this could play into our hands because the problem with City as well is that every week, because of their squad depth, we just don't know who's going to play. We don't know who's going to play. And obviously, if they're looking at both games, which is of more importance, you're absolutely, as Pep and as the Shakes will want, it will be the Champions League game that will take priority. Absolutely, right? Yeah, it has to be. I, I, there's just added pressure to win it. They've won the League Cup for, what, the past three seasons now? Yeah. Uh, they, they're going to prioritise that Champions League game, which I don't think... I think he might overthink that game because there is more pressure on it, um, mm -hmm. on them to win it. But, I mean, so we'll just quickly, very quickly go through the lineup. So, Loris in goal, mm -hmm. right back, um, Tangangov we've agreed on. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to say, yeah. Um, Toby and one of Polygon Head or Donkey. Um, I'm gonna say Dyer. Dyer. Uh, yeah. Dyer. Regulon at left back. Um, midfield pivot of Hoybier and Ndombele. Ndombele. Yeah. You, you're sure? Because that intensity is not gonna be there. No, but he can, he can beat the press even even at 50. He can, he can beat the press. And that's what we need in that midfield. Winks can't <clears throat> put any put of pressure on Winks and he, he'll fold. And Sissoko just points. So um, I think Ndombele is the best shout. <laughs> I'd rather have, personally, I'd rather have Ndombele a bit further forward and have someone like Sissoko, who hasn't played for Jose at least. Let's see if he plays for Mason. I don't know. I'll, I'll take that chance, but... Um, so we'll, we'll go with yours anyway. We'll go with yours. Mora is a sort of number ten and a front three of Bale, Song, Kane. Yeah. So yeah. say say Kane doesn't say Kane isn't fit, lads. Who are we who are we going with? I think we played the same team as yesterday, but Winks instead of Le Celso. Okay. Okay, and then yeah, Ndombele... I mean, yeah, yeah. Ndombele is going forward, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, um, makes, that makes sense, that makes sense. We just... The thing with Lacelso, his his decision-making oh. is, so, is, is so slow. You know, he doesn't release the ball quick enough. And he's... 
if he gets fouled, he stays on the ground for about 10 minutes. Like, get out of it. Come on. I know you're South American, but I want you to, <laughs> to be good, man. Like, come on. Like, there, was not, there was a number of times yesterday when if he is like a second or millisecond quicker in his, in his decision making in his mind, it opens We're in. Up. It opens it up, you know? Like, and it does it. It doesn't make sense because his goal contributions at Betis was very good. That's what we signed yeah. him for. Yes. So his decision making in that final third should be excellent because that's what we brought him in for. But he hasn't done enough since he's joined. The game's the game's slower. The game is slower on the continent. And you look at his better games for us since he's come back from injury or whatever have been European. Yeah, it's true. When he came on, I think he came on one of our European games um and for 20 minutes or so, and you look really good because the game's slower. You get a little bit more time on the ball. The English Premier League, you know, it, it doesn't give you that life. It will humble you, bro. It will absolutely it will humble you, definitely. And so with our approach, do we sit back, break? Do we try and play on the front foot against the City side who will absolutely demolish you? What, I mean, what, what's the plan? We, you know, we are going to have to concede possession. Uh, most teams, I mean, maybe bar 18, 19, 19, 20 Liverpool can really go at them with confidence. Um, they do have a better defence, sort of central, central defensive pairing. So, in many respects, I feel like the low block that was used with Mourinho worked. But even then, we conceded a lot of possession and we conceded a lot of chances that day. Um, I wouldn't say we should go for broke against them, but I feel like we have to use a counter-attacking element to our game on the weekend. I think that's the only way that will that will get any sort of positive out of the game. Like even yesterday when I was watching the Villa game, um, Villa just caught Man City pretty much as on off 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 the break. So I feel like that would probably be the only place we would really catch them. Zinchenko's not amazingly quick. Carl Walker's probably very quick. Um, Diaz, not amazing. And Laporte is fairly athletic. So if we can get in and break the lines in behind uh, Gundogan and uh, Rodrigo, then I'd say, absolutely, we've got Son, got Bale, potentially with Kane as well. There's no reason why, why we won't be able to try and get at them at least, you know. But it's going to be difficult. Like, I'm going to be very expecting that we are going to concede possession. I'm very expecting that we are going to... There's, there's going to be a very disparate XG between the two <laughs> at the weekend. But, um, I mean, I think that's what would be the case against most teams that play Man City. Yeah. Anyway, a, a Pep Guardiola Man City. Anyway. Dave, mm. is it uh, Kane and Inshallah or... Will other players step up? Will be able Listen, to step up. Right. I mean, we need Kane. Um, I think even at seventy five percent fit, he still is a better option than relying on a, a front three or some sort of you know interchanging kind of forward role. Um, what the the thing about Kane and why he's so effective, especially against a team like City, is because he does drop deep, and you have to respect him when he drops deep. So he brings one of their defenders out. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that opens up a bit of space. And I think in, when we beat them 2-0, I think Ndombele actually went up as, as a nine sometimes because if the ball goes into him, he's probably going to hold on to it. So it kind of worked between the two of them kind of alternating. Um, um, yeah, we do need in there. Um, I, I wouldn't trust the other forwards to lead the line for 90 minutes. Um, they will have flashes. They'll, they'll be. I think Lucas. I think I can see Lucas making a couple driving runs at their back line, winning some fouls. We can see that Bell. I think Bell will finish if he gets the opportunity. Um, I think he's still got that in his locker. Obviously, we saw that last night. A great finish. Um, but yeah, Kane just makes a, a whole difference. Not only just in scoring goals, but creating goals and and helping our play look a little bit more fluid. And also, we can go a bit more direct when we got Kane because he could be the one hitting those passes. We know he's accurate with his passing. Um, that's something that Lo Celso wasn't doing yesterday. Lo Celso was missing some easy passes. Um, 
So we really need Kane to be able to do that. Um, in terms of overall setup, especially defensively, I, I don't think we need to necessarily play a low, low block like we've been doing um, under uh, the old manager. Um, but I do think we can... It's one, it's one of the ones where as a coach you pick and choose. We don't have a team of athletes who can go for 90 minutes and press, press, press like how Liverpool do. But why Mason needs to turn around and say, right, when the ball goes into these areas, that's when we're going for it. So pick. It's either central or wide. Okay, I think the best one would be wide. When it goes wide, we're pressing, we're winning it back, and then we're trying to make something happen. Um, and we've got to be clinical. We will get a couple of chances. Absolutely. Especially Absolutely. if they play Stefan in goal. If they play Stefan in goal, then I'm shooting from distance, mate. I'm I'm shooting all over the gas. Got to be clinical. Absolutely yeah. have to be clinical, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Interesting to see. When you shout when you said press, 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 I got PTSD from Scout <laughs> Sacramento, man. Uh, nah. nah. <laughs> No, I thought we were over this. Like, you <laughs> know what, drives, that what drives that even more home is the fact that they didn't even like him. So imagine they're not coaching you in training to press, and then on a Saturday they're shouting press, 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 and you don't even like them. You'd be like, "Shut the hell up over there, man! What are you talking <laughs> about, man?" They're like, no, oh, PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And finally, uh, predictions, score lines. What are you both uh, thinking? Oh, uh, predictions. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I actually think it's going to be a draw in 90 minutes. Yeah? Either be one or two, two in 90 minutes, and then potluck. You know Can't what? Go way, but I do think it'll be a draw in nine minutes. Yeah, I can get with that. You know, now that I think about it, yeah, I can get with that. City have lost one in twenty something, so yeah, I, a score draw, ninety minutes, and after that, anything can happen. What will happen though? <laughs> <laughs> will we win it? <laughs> go on, go for glory. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, Bears, I'm, let's go. I'm gonna say yeah. I'm gonna let's say do it. Yeah. I, I, I would hope that a lot of the guys who have been at the club would want to will ourselves to try and win. There's no motivation for City to win. They've won this. There's won this before. They've got the Champions League to think about. You know, I, I would want us to to be willed. Players like Toby, players like Hugo, players like Kane. Uh, you know, all these players, players who have been some who've been in the squad when we've been up and down. I would hope that they would want to will themselves to do it for the football club. So I would say yes. Score draw, 90 minutes, extra time, we win on extra time of pen. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a killjoy and say if it was with Jose, we'd we'd have lost this game six nil, hundred percent. um I'm gonna say I'm gonna say three one city. I think we'll go for it. We'll try. But I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry. I I, I can't I can't predict us to win and then we lose and then there's egg on my face. <laughs> but anyway man it was a it was a good chat great pod once again good chatting to you lads and uh yeah um uh, thanks for coming on once again and we'll catch you on the next one peace Sweet. nice one nice, nice.